right. Hello to everybody that is tuning in tonight for tonight's Coach's Corner episode. Um, as everybody's turning their cameras on and getting settled, I'm going to say a couple words uh, just to welcome everybody. If you have questions, by all means, please ask them. You may post them in the chat box. I will be keeping an eye on them and everybody will try to get to them tonight. If we cannot, it's just a matter of time. It's not at all personal. So feel free to head on over to the coach's corner and they can help you there as well afterwards. I believe that's it for me with all of our housekeeping. So with that being said, Duke Sean, I'm gonna pass this off to you to introduce tonight's episode. All right. All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you again for joining us on the Coach's Corner. We're uh, definitely happy to have you tuning in. Um, we've got an episode tonight that um, has been another topic of conversation that we wanted to, to cover. This is part of our uh, continuing series on kind of the elephant in the room, uh, some of those subjects that uh, don't often come up in uh, just the strictly fighting circles. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about um, uh, recruiting and retention and, and uh, making sure that as trainers of our sport, um, as people that uh, are aspiring to sit the highest uh, thrones in our society, mm -hmm. that uh, that we are doing what we can to, to make sure that we are creating an environment that people want to be part of. Um, and this is the, the general gist of it. Um, tonight, we've got uh, His Grace Eliyahu uh, from the Mid-Realm joining us, Viscount Tristan, um, and Viscount Sir Sagan, some of our regular coaches. And then we're also uh, honored to have tonight as a special guest, uh, Sir Eva, uh, uh, Duchess uh, of Lockhock and uh, Laurel as well. Um, she and I had had some really great conversations about uh, recruiting and retention. And uh, so I wanted to include her in this, uh, in this conversation. Um, so it's been, uh, we're really, really happy to have her. And uh, thanks for joining us for the, for the first time and, and uh, no doubt uh, many more. So, Thank you for having me. Yeah. Would you like to say a little something about yourself? Uh, if you'd like. So uh, my name is Sir Eva von Danzig. I'm from the Kingdom of Lockhart, uh, which is situated in Australia and New Zealand. I've been fighting for uh, about 16 years, and I got authorized as a 16-year-old. Um, the thing that really attracted me to the society was one, the history, um, but also the, the culture that the society has created is what kind of, I think, keeps me involved because we have a sense of, you know, the, the family that you choose and just the, the valor of combat and the culture that we have is intoxicating when you get into it. So I'm really happy to be able to talk about how we can attract more people to it and hopefully keep them around and uh, spread the joy. Oh. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to, to Tristan and uh, let him kind of lead off our discussion a little bit. Cool. Thank you. <clears throat> um, one thing you might ask with the subject being, uh, how do we recruit more people? How do we retain them once we have them? Why would that be an elephant in the room subject? Like, what's the sensitive part of that discussion? You'd think that that would be something that would, you could, you could, discuss without it be feeling, feeling awkward. Like why, why is this, what's, what do we, what minefield are we walking through with it? And, and to my mind, the, the, the minefield is what are we doing wrong? What could we be doing better? It's a personal responsibility factor. And I've been hearing arguments back 50, you know, 10, 15 years or more of why isn't the SCA getting more people all the way from gas prices are in increasing and people don't have money to travel to computer games have come out and they've gotten really good and people would rather sit at home doing computer games than be in the SCA. All of these are external influences or excuses that we could use for why we shouldn't be doing a better job of making sure when somebody shows up to the SCA, they are welcomed, they are shown a clear path for, for what the SCA is, how they can participate and being welcomed in actively, not just a, we're here if you want to play, come and involve yourself. But if you don't want to do that, you're basically going to feel like you've kind of had the door slammed in your face. Um, and I've, from a marketing standpoint, I've always believed that the SCA could do a lot better when it comes to how we deal with bringing new people in, how we respond to them when they show up how we walk them through, okay, if you're interested in this, here's what you can do to get involved. Um, 
So th that's that's the reason why it's kind of the elephant in the room is what can we do better? We're never going to deal with fixing gas prices. We're never going to deal with fixing computer games. We're never going to deal with all that. And what Sareva said that I really liked about her description was what brought her to the SCA? What was the passion? What was what tapped into that passionate side that said, this is something I want to be involved with? For me, it was the fact that the SCA is hands on. I'm not sitting there with a keyboard and a mouse. I want to get my hands on leather. I want to get my hands on metal. I want to get my hands on, you know, getting an armor, getting sweaty. For that factor alone, the SCA will always outcompete a computer game. We have far more immersive experience than a computer game ever will. So putting that to bed, that argument to bed, you know, then we can open up other ones like, uh, is the SCA growing too old? Um, you know, we're not recruiting college age students or college age kids the way we used to, because that was a main, main factor. But these are topics that are going to come into how do we take people in? and do it in an effective way? How do we improve our game? How do we clean up our act? And part of that is the experience that, that a new person feels when they walk in the room. Do they feel like they're welcomed? All the way up to somebody participates for six months, 12 months, and now we start getting into, they start seeing bad behavior and they start seeing bad behavior that goes unchecked. It's not dealt with. Um, they've, they're driven out by politics and by bad um yeah, just bad bad behavior in general. And and these like things to, turn people off. I'd like to say something about that. Since yeah, sure, go ahead. you you mentioned Tristan, you mentioned marketing and how the SCA markets itself. And that's my area. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that <clears throat> I've advised client companies about in their marketing efforts is never to promise something that they can't deliver. Because if uh, unlike what people who don't actually practice marketing and advertising think it's about actually telling the truth. And if you make a promise as a company or an organization, and then the experience that people have of that organization is different, now you've lost them because they don't believe you. And if we're talking about the SCA, if we're positioning it as a brand positioning, as a, a community, uh, a supportive community where you can try all kinds of different skills and arts and things and it's supportive and it's friendly and it's courteous and it's kind and it's people are encouraged to do their best. And then they, based on that, they join and then they're in for a while and they see they see that bad behavior and it's not dealt with then that breaks the trust, which is the first essential ingredient for anyone to do business with anyone else or to join an organization. And if that trust is broken, it's very hard to gain it back. So the tool set that the SCA has had over the years for dealing with fulfilling that promise of, of community and supportive and safe for people has has the tool sets grown but it still needs it needs constant attention from all of us particularly those of us who by virtue of the positions we've earned or attained have some influence on behavior and the question is how can we how can we clean it up how can we fix it all right well, I, I always like going back to fundamentals when it comes to your a rebuilding and you could view that maybe because it's the co because of the COVID, the lockdowns thing that the SCA is going to have to go through a rebuilding phase. But you could also say before the lockdowns happened that what was happening needed, we needed a rebuilding. The SCA needed to kind of resort how it was doing what it was doing. We sort of just kind of coasted along. Mm -hmm. Um, and to, in my mind, and this is probably going to be controversial, but the hinge pin of the SCA is fighting. It is the spectacle. It is the main activity. It's the one that has the most passion attached to it. Um, and, and it is the core activity that the SCA is built upon. 
and there are probably a lot of people that would say, oh my God, I can't believe you're saying that. That is heresy. It's got, you know, we're about the arts, we're about the sciences, we're about dancing, we're about all this, you know, feasting. I guarantee you, you're not going to get a society worldwide built on going to court or woodworking. You're just not going to do it. And I think we as fighters, we as coaches, we in the fighting community, it's more than just us learning a martial art. And this may seem a little odd coming from a group of coaches that are talking about coaching a martial art, but the activity that we provide are, we are kind of like the gladiators that people want to come and see beat the crap out of each other. We, we are the spectacle. We're more than just martial artists who want to hone our art. We provide the, the, the foundation for other people to come and enjoy themselves that they like to watch us do what we do. And as soon as we try to, for the sake of p political correctness, shove that aside and say, no, the society is about everything else, that has led to kind of a, it's just not popular. How many people are going to get in their car and drive eight hours each way to attend an ANS competition? Not many. Not I mean, I hate to say it, but that yeah. it is what it is. But they'll watch idiots beat the shit out of each other. All <laughs> yeah. You know, they like they like that. And we even had, I remember at our local practice, we had a huge gym. It was like a basketball court. And we would have fighters show up maybe a dozen 15 we'd get 50 people that would show up to fighting practice because they just like to have fighting going on in the background just because it was kind of fun to watch and they would it was like bigger than our baronial meeting just because they had that atmosphere of we've got people that are fighting and and it's just kind of fun to watch it's like having a you know a, a ufc channel going on in the background i guess that's why sports bars have got athletic stuff going on on big screen TVs all the time because your eye is just drawn to it. Yeah. Hey, Sagan, you had some thoughts on that too? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things that I'd love to say that since I've been a member since 19, <laughs> it's gotten better. Unfortunately, some of the same things I ran into back then are still here now. So as coaches, as knights, you know, we, we do have our duties and our responsibilities. And one of those duties and responsibilities is to look out for newcomers, to sustain interest in the SCA as well as armored combat. And it is our job to, at least from my point of view, it's my job as well. And it's a job I've enjoyed for, for a number of years. Uh, as uh, Iliahu alluded to, yes, we do have a toolbox. However, the uh, performance ratio of a tool is based on its user. And as he also said, we don't have a lot of uh, ways in which we increase or enhance that usage. I'm sorry, Viscount Tristan, I disagree with you, buddy. I know lots of people that will drive eight hours to go to an ANS. And it is one of those things that I also agree with you. They will come and watch us beat the snot out of one another whenever possible, especially since, quote unquote, we are the leaders of the ruling class. However, our consorts may not be part of the chivalry. So while we are taking on that responsibility, so when a crown tournament shows up, we are responsible, right? We know the rules, we know how this works. However, we are also in the eyes of the populace present. And within that populace is a certain percentage of newcomers and or people who have not been in a very long time. And so our actions directly affect their perception of how this works and how things occur and do not occur, how things go well, how things do not go well. So it is incumbent upon us to recognize that we do play a heavy role, at least as far as fighting goes, in how we are perceived because their perception is their reality. 
And speaking of someone who uh, is a consort and a member of the chivalry, <laughs> turn that over to Eva. <laughs> I am one of the uh, the fortunate few, especially in my second reign. It was it was nice to sort of have that lead up of oh yeah, I know what's going on. I've done this before. Um, I wanted to add something that I think that's really important is that one of the interesting aspects of the society that's different to other uh, historical martial arts group is we tend to be more of a lifestyle kind of club. You know, the people who get deeply immersively involved tend to do several things. So I know a, a great deal of knights and, and royal peers and fighters who are also laurels or pelicans or mods. Uh, and, and that's one of the things that is peculiar, peculiar to what we do is that there is so much to do that people can be so immersed that it pretty much becomes their entire lifestyle. It becomes their entire social group. And it's important to realize that one of the other peculiarities is one of the first taglines that we hear about, because a lot of what we do is uh, oral tradition, is we are a courtesy and chivalry based society. Now, the definition of that will be slightly different from person to person and the way that's interpreted will be different from person to person, which means that it creates conflict because my idea of courtesy and chivalry and an idyllic society might be different to Viscount Tristan's or it might be different to Viscount Sagan's. And because those words are so powerful and impassioned in our minds, that is actually where a lot of conflict can come from is that we all have different ideals. So for trainers and for anyone who's a leader in your group or in your region, it's important to have conversations and to be empathetic. So you wanna lead with conscience, whether you're on the throne or not. And it's a lot of the time about trying to come to mutual understandings and to compromise. And as a trainer that ties in well with trying to you know, work out how a new person learns and what's gonna work for them because we're all individuals. So I really think it's important to hold that in your mind. Like the society actually is so powerful for the fact that I think we might be one of the clubs that has the largest number of people that hang out on our social media just to pop up and say, this is why I left the SCA, but they're still interacting. So they still care. And that is the thing that we need to keep in our minds is that people are so passionate about this game. And that's kind of why we should be having conversations trying to understand multiple perspectives and coming to a, a, a sense of harmony whenever we can. Sometimes there will be times that we can't, but certainly uh, as Duke Uther says, you know, the SCA is one big umbrella and there's room for all different types of play. Mm -hmm. So we sh if we wanna retain the most amount of people and keep everyone happy, we do have to lead with a sense of empathy, be willing to have hard conversations and try to come to a sense of harmony rather than just trying to have a blanket rule to fix every problem, because that's mm -hmm. simply not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But certainly thinking about it being a lifestyle and making it worth it for the people that are coming to your training. You know, everyone's going to be slightly different. We all have different limitations. We all have a different amount of time and energy to give. And so you want to make sure that you remind people that it's, it's fun and it should be fun. And if it's not fun, why not? And that's, that's my thought. Eli, you had something else on that? Yeah, and I, I think I'm, I'm more in the, in along what Eva said, rather than Tristan, I think that for me, the appeal, of the SCA many years ago, was not simply fighting, it was that I could pursue all of my many interests in a single place, in one social context. I could, the arts and the, the martial art and the, the fine arts and history and other things, I could do all in one context rather than having to go to a dojo, which I do anyway, and do other, pursue things in, in other places. The, the strength of the SCA has always been its breadth, that large umbrella. And certainly people will be different but the, the single common thread other than history is courtesy and chivalry. And the, one of the appeals for me of the SCA 
was the fact that people were courteous. Given that the people weren't in the larger world or in in other sports I participated in, it was it was only cheating if you got caught. And people in if fighters in the SCA will say to an opponent, "No, don't take that. It wasn't good." That would never happen in in lots of in most other sports. And that courtesy runs through not just off the field behavior, but on the field behavior. The idea of showing an, uh, an opponent mercy when you have them at a disadvantage is unheard of in a lot of other sports. Um, so <clears throat> it's the, the appeal of courtesy. And when, so for me, it's not just the fighting, it's the everything. It's the gestalt of the, the SCA and the ability to pursue everything, but everything imbued with a sense of courtesy and chivalry. And when we allow people in that umbrella who don't follow that, and yeah, there are different definitions of courtesy and chivalry, but when we allow the people who are the missing stare, and if, if you're, um, I think everybody here is familiar with the term, somebody you have, that person, usually guy, you have to warn people about, say, yeah, don't let new people go near that guy. Don't let, don't let that guy near your daughters. Because, and I've heard that before. If we're allowing that, that's a problem because we're breaking the trust and we're not defending courtesy and chivalry. And, but when, I, when I've asked knights from around the known world, hey, if you've got a knight who's behaving badly, What's your mechanism for dealing with that? And it ranges from nothing to we take them out behind the barn and have some of the bigger knuckle dragging knights talk to him, talk to him, or we have to goes the away. Crown, talk to the yeah, crown. Or, yeah. Away. So, but we have we ha we have to defend courtesy and chivalry, even if people don't define it all the same way there's there's a sense of being being nice be good to each other you know be excellent to each other and party on, party on quote, yeah. those philosophers bill and ted um so <laughs> that's what i have to say all right tristan um yeah and he, he Eliyahu touches on a, a future elephant in the room episode that we want to cover which is policing our own which is what happens when we run into that overtly bad behavior and that's a whole nother pandora's box that we really don't want to get into necessarily here but i did want to address one thing and that is when i said that 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 fighting was the hinge pin around the the sc activity i didn't mean that that fighting was the one and only interest that the sca has Think about the architecture of the Colosseum in Rome. There was the, the main Colosseum, there was seats for the observers, and around it were all kinds of booths. You can think of it like a modern stadium. Merchants, there were vendors, there were people that was they were doing all kinds of activity, but it was because the people were drawn to it to watch the spectacle of what was going on in the arena itself. Like that was, if you took away the gladiators and the combat, and just had merchants and doing their own thing, it would just be a shopping mall. It would not have it would not have been built on anything that would have been sustainable. It would have just been another merchant fair. And so the idea that people are drawn to the spectacle was my point. That that's the importance of of what we have as fighters, and and we can we as martial artists can get drawn into our track of I just want to be a better combatant. I want to learn to the art. Whereas you're not acknowledging the fact that the, your greater role in, in burgeoning the SCA and in, in boosting up what the SCA is by the fact that you maybe improve your armor uh, with recruiting. When new people show up, don't just go get in your armor and go learn the new shot that you want to go train with. Say, how can I help this person? Say, you, you, they want to do this too. And how can I help them get into it? Mentor them be more than just a combatant, be a mentor, a represent, representative. And I agree totally with the courtesy stuff that Eliyahu was talking about. Um, 
it's it's not just about how I can be better. It's about how my fellow new fighters can be better. How can I bring people into this? Be a be a an ambassador of the SCA to to other people. Um, one observation that I uh, that I've made is that the Chatelaine is probably the most important officer in the SCA. That's the welcome wagon, and. I don't know about how anybody else's group has gone, but in ours, they always choose the, the worst person ever to be the Chatelaine. <laughs> it's like the, the like the person you described earlier, like don't let this person near anybody. Like they're the, they're the worst representative ever. And, you know, they're some groups have done person. a great job of getting a, a fantastic yeah. Chatelaine that is the perfect first person for them to meet. Yeah. Um, and when that happens, it's great. But I've heard so many people like, yeah, you know, my group is the, the, the Chatelaine's the last person they think of, of, of staffing well, but it's the first person they, that should be, you, you need to pick an MVP to be your Chatelaine, like you really do. So that's what I wanted to pitch in. And uh, at, at the same time, uh, to your, your greater point there, um, the, um, fighting is the, is the hook. Um, it's, it's what, it, it's what grabs people's attention uh, right off the bat to begin with, and once they're kind of hooked by that and they and they see that, the rest of the society, including the arts and sciences, including the archery and everything, that's the glue that holds everything together. It is. There's so much more to go into. Yeah, I mean, fighting is what gets people in, but it's all those other things that that make it worthwhile and make it Absolutely. something that that families want to be part of. Um, and really, it, without without an interest in the arts and sciences, I mean, we're we are just another martial art. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, so there's there's that. Um, so I wanted to kind of uh, address the elephant in the room a little bit. Um, you know, w over the last I don't know three or four years there has been a, a greater emphasis or recognition of issues involving uh, bullying and harassment. Um, Eli mentioned the, the, the broken stair concept. Um, uh, for those not familiar with the broken stair concept, it is, as, as he kind of alluded to, it's, it's, the, it's the person that you know is a problem and rather than fixing the stair, rather than addressing the problem, you just tell people not to step on it, you know, oh, don't, don't step there. You, you teach people to, to avoid those things. And, and, and frankly, I think that is something that the society has been really terrible about. Um, and agreed, yeah. um, you know, and, you know, and we, one of the part of the conversation that I had with uh, Eva recently was, you know, the, the difference between, like as, as crowns, as royal peers, there are things that happen, you know, people often talk about, you know, seeing behind the veil and seeing like the, the, what I refer to as the seedy underbelly of the SCA, you know, there are some things that happen behind the scenes that, that majority of the populace of the, of the society doesn't need to know happens. Um, those uncomfortable conversations where I have to go to my king and say, I know you think this is a good idea, but this is not a good idea, um, as Sagan has done for me on multiple occasions. <clears throat> um, but but I want to be clear in that there's a big difference between, you know, kind of helping massage things behind the scenes. There's a difference between that and covering up a problem. And I think the society for a long time has uh, has deferred to covering up a problem or handling it as Eli said, you know, behind the woodshed, um, that sort of stuff. Um, you know, and um, Duke Dagg of the, the middle uh, did his interview with uh, Rifkin last week. And one of the things that he said that, that really touched me was, uh, you know, it's not, it's not enough for justice to be done. Uh, justice must be seen to be done. Um, Absolutely. And I, and, and I think that's, that's, again, that's something we've been really terrible about. Um, and, I, and I don't just mean the, a lot of people want to talk about the expecting more transparency at, at the BOD level. That's a, a slightly different thing. I don't, I don't know. I think there's a limit to how much transparency is really the answer because sometimes you don't want to know that you're, that, that somebody you like just really screwed up. Um, and so I, I transparency is, is really needed there, but people need to know that that there was a problem. And uh, you know something that came up on um, 
uh, Sir Helga did her interview with the sisters yesterday and, and something else that she had mentioned was, you know, it was, it's this, there was a behavior and there was a punishment for the behavior, but we don't tell people what the behavior was and what that punishment was or what the corrective action was. Like in order for us to understand what is acceptable and not acceptable behavior, like we do have to have a certain level of, of transparency to be able to say that, that this was this was a problem. This is how we dealt with this problem. Don't be this problem. Um, don't be that guy, basically. Um, and, you know, and that's that's some of the stuff that, that we're talking about is how we can uh, and how, how we can be better about that. Um, I know Eli's got something, but I'm going to I'm going to hand this over to, to Eva real quick yeah. on that. That's fine. I wanted to jump back in, um, basically because I, I wanted to kind of clarify that the reason I bring up the, the courtesy and chivalry based society is because I feel like the attempt that we make in the society is to make an idyllic society where most people, I think, for the very most part, when you look at our demographic, are trying. And so it hurts more when we fail for people around us. Um, and, and that's the thing, we put the society on the pedestal, so you've got further to fall. So when somebody makes a mistake, uh, and I'm not talking about breaking the law, racism, misogyny, that sort of stuff is, is different in my mind. What I'm talking about is somebody gave me mean feedback and now they're awful. And then you have rifts in your group because of a small disagreement, or maybe you don't like a particular choice that somebody makes when they're fighting on the field. You know, I'm, I'm talking about these are the things we communicate about. I think uh, I really want to move into talking about recruitment because I actually think that that is a huge problem that we have in the society right now is that we're not the only game in town. As Viscount Tristan said, there are plenty of video games. There are lots of other groups that have come to the fore and suddenly the society isn't the only place where you can do medieval combat. So um, I would really like to talk a little bit more about that seeing as there'll be an episode coming up more about how to police our own. Um, but one thing that I, I will continue to say is that when it comes to if you see something awful happening in the society, it's not just the leaders or trainers or knights or royal peers responsibility to do something about that. You can seek those people for support, but absolutely every person in the society has the ability and the responsibility to do something if you see that. We have a grievance procedure, report it. If it's a police matter, call the police. Um, I just want to always put that out there because I think we talk about it a lot from a philosophical standpoint of who should be involved in what we should do. Literally, if you see something that is unjust, you have a means of doing something about that. And I would encourage everyone to feel empowered by that. That's all I got. All right. I think we've got uh, Eli coming up next. Yeah, I completely agree. <laughs> I completely agree with that. That and part of what mechanism that used to happen and perhaps still does is that the peers believed that they had a, a duty to handle all the problems behind the scene so as to protect the populace from knowing about them so the populace could simply enjoy the society and what they're doing. And that's contrary to the idea of justice being seen to be done. And so those two kind of work at odds and it, it infantilizes the populace to think that they can't handle knowing about something. There is, there is no, uh, if, if this were a class, I'd say we don't have a rubric. We don't have saying, here's, here's what you should do. Here's what, you, what you'll lose points for. Essentially, we just have courtesy and chivalry. Um, so I think that the idea that everybody has a, an obligation, no matter their rank in the society to say something is absolutely true. I, I completely agree with that. If it, if the chain, if the reporting goes to the police, that's one thing. If it goes up through people in the society and there's a, uh, any of those steps fall down or try to hide it or try to dismiss it, then it's a problem. And then we're, we have a problem. 
And there's another point about recruiting, which I'll segue into, is that we used to, the group I started in, we had our fighting practices um, on or near a college campus so that students walking by could see what we were doing, see the fighting, which was noisy and flashy and would attract them, but also see people there doing other um, arts. And that's how we, that's how we recruited people. That hasn't happened that way in a long time. There were other places with better weather that would have practices in parks um, and they would recruit people that way. Uh, I don't know what the status of that is. So I think making practices visible to people is one of the things that is an outreach to people that can make a difference. Say again. Well, you know, we've covered quite a bit. Uh, I want to thank my sister. I really did want to segue into the recruitment and retainment aspect of this myself, as far as being a trainer. Um, it is one of those things that making yourself available, right? So, but in recruitment, you have to be involved from the standpoint of what is available. As far as we do sports, we do woodworking, we do this, we do that, to the point that whoever this new person is gets the understanding. Now, that retainment is a different story. If they've already been in the SCA for a while, and you have not mentioned, as, as is Grace Iliahu said, you haven't mentioned the negative at all, well, you've only told this person half the story. And I think that's where a lot of uh, misconception, uh, misinformation, you didn't tell me about this, why don't you guys take care of that, comes up. And when that comes up, now we've got a whole other side of things to deal with. What I can say is, as in my role as a trainer, I do cover all the bases, especially in the retainment. In recruitment, I let them know what's offered, and I follow up with anybody who's interested in having uh, a conversation about the fighting. Uh, needless to say, I don't go heavily into the negative side of it at first, but I do cover it a little bit. And I think for me, at least, that's where at the end of the day, I can look at myself and say, okay, you did the best you could given, given this situation. And one of the things I've always told my household is that if you keep everyone's good time in the palm of your hands, and I mean everyone, it'll be hard for you to go wrong. You will make mistakes. It'll be hard for you to go wrong. All right. All right, Eva, let's jump right into it. Awesome. Cool. Um, so recruitment, it's interesting uh, coming from Lockhart because we do still have a couple of active colleges. So the recruitment and uh, trainings on some college campuses is still a pull here. Um, but one of the things that I think is really important is getting the SEA out there and showing what we do well. Um, so, you know, I think most groups have some sort of demonstration or demo fights that you'll do at different events. Every group is different, but I think everyone knows of uh, an example in your local region. One of the really important things is to think about how you present the society at that point. And you should always try to be as approachable as possible. So part of that will be uh, when people come to talk to you, make sure that you're available. If you see people that are looking kind of interested and they want to ask questions, talk to those people, you know, um, encourage the people, let people know before the demo as well. You're expected to talk. Don't just come to fight and then go off to the side and, and you know, hang out with your buddies because you want to look approachable. I know uh, like early on, at least in my group, I started at a time when the group of, of heavy combatants didn't particularly look approachable. We had quite a few people come later when we had some some younger, smaller fighters that went, oh, we thought that that was like a biker game meetup or something because the guys just didn't look approachable. And, you know, part of that will be your, your stature, but there's always, you know, you want to break that kind of vision of yourself by going and, and talking to people who look like they're interested and pitching what we do. 
Um, there are some simple tricks as well that can make that really useful, which is even just trying to remember somebody's name. Because if you can go, oh, hey, what's your name? Oh, it's Sean. Cool. Well, this is what we do. Here's some arts and sciences stuff. You know, these people do this. We have this. All right, Sean, I'll see you at the next training. And that sticks with people. It's, it's like making it personable. And that communication is really key because what we want for people to do as soon as possible is to experience the fun of the SCA. So you want them to think, oh, I can do this. Part of that as well is, you know, I, I'm a big believer in wear your best to a demo, bring your banners, wear your amazing surcoat and your best armor. But one of the things that we found is it's actually really useful to have a couple of your newer, probably scrubbier looking fighters out there as well, because you want people to look at it and go, I can do that. You know, if you have everyone on the field looks like they're in their best battle of 30 kit, some people will be scared away by that. So make sure that, you know, you get as many fighters together for your demonstrations as you can. Uh, and also, you know, some other artisans and, and people who just want to come along and be social and pitch the SCA. But the fun should be at the forefront of what you're pitching to them. That's really good. Some really good points. You know, when we were, when we used to do demos, I remember we had some, some that had some problems because we would get people out there and pick a bucket armor and people would look like, what, what is this? You know, and then of course, as armor evolved and we started kind of choosing, all right, who do we want to have go to these demos? We had a Chatelaine that was pretty with it and said, okay, let's put our better foot forward rather than showing a bunch of people that look like they're like a Mad Max extra reject going out and, and doing the fighting part. And I, I agree with you. I think that it can be intimidating to see somebody in really expensive, nice armor and go, I could never get something like that together. I think the visual is important, but what's even more important is the is the spirit and the heart behind that first contact when somebody says, wow, this looks really impressive. And you say, you know what? You can do this. I've done it. You can do it. I can show you how to do this. It's not as, it's not, there's not as many, uh, as many obstacles as you think there are to be able to do what we're doing. In fact, let me show you how to take the first step. It's, it's not so much what you show them in terms of the visual, because the visual is important. It's the, it's the one thing that you see a couple of people fighting across the park. You're like, what are those people doing? And you're drawn to that part. But it's the, it's the intention behind what that person, what happens when that person walks up and goes, what are you guys doing? And if there was one big improvement that I could, I could say that will make the, that huge difference is what your attitude is when a new person shows up. And there's, there's a story from a Penzik long time ago. I think it was like Penzik 19 or 20. And I had a friend of mine that came out for it and he did a, <clears throat> came out early and he participated in some uh, civil war reenactment stuff before he came to Penzik. And I said, well, I asked him when he got there, like, well, how, how did this go? What, what was it? What was civil war reenactors like? And he, and he said, you know, it's a lot of older people that, that have been in there, that, that group forever. And they're just like, Nazis they're so picky everybody's got to do everything perfectly or it's not good enough and what happened was you'd get young new interested engaged people that were curious and thought hey this could be pretty cool and then you make the initial bar up for their participation so high to get acceptance by the people that have done it for a long time that they just say you know what screw this I don't care about my buttons I just want to dress in an outfit and go ahead and have a good time. And you guys don't want to do that. So basically within that community, they were having, they were getting to that catch 22 point of, they didn't get enough new people in, they would repel new people because of their attitude. And then their numbers were shrinking because they're getting old and dying. And the whole course of that group was headed to oblivion. And the only way to do that is to overcome it is to say, all right, we're going to accept that new people are going to come in. We want their passion. That's what you're looking for is their passion. Not how good they can do coming out of the gate. It's their interest. And to fan that, that flame, that little spark into a flame and then, and then fan it into a raging fire. Um, so 
that's what I've got. So we're going to go on to what, uh, Eli? Eli? You're muted. There we go. Thank you. Every time, right? Okay. Um, so a couple of things. Um, you mentioned, Tristan, you mentioned the Chatelaine who shouldn't be the Chatelaine. And uh, when we've had demos um, and or events in a public place that people can see, uh, it's important in a demo that there are people there who specifically are tasked with interfacing with the public who are able to do it well. And if you've got a demo, you're doing a, uh, a, an event in a public place, make sure that the person who doesn't have anything to do and is just around the outside of the event, they're the one who gets asked questions by new people or by observers or interviewed by the media. A lot of places have a media officer now, make sure that they're involved in it. And if you're doing a demo, make sure you've got, and those, those people who are tasked to interface with the public, make sure they've got information to hand out contact information so people can follow up, make sure that the information they'll go to the website and so on, or the contact person is able to follow up with them and do so well. Make sure, try to capture their names and email addresses so you can follow up with them. Continue, it's not just, don't just do the demo and think that's enough. You have to continue the engagement with them and reach out to people let them find you on social media and and so on um and and make certain that the people who are interacting with the public and the media are the people you want to who can present the sca well say again yeah one of the things i've noticed over the years uh because we do uh quite a few of our practices in public parks and obviously we have people they'll come up and they'll stay at a distance is to you know allow them to watch for a while, but then approach them. Don't 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 wait for them to approach you, and just open the conversation with something with "Hi, do you have any questions?" And invariably, they're going to say, "What is this?" or "Who are you?" And then that will lead you, you know, to the opportunity to converse with them about the SCA. Uh, one of the other things is that, and especially at demos is that uh, make sure, you, like you're saying, you want to put your best foot forward. So you go over some uh, rules of etiquette, you know, things like courtesy, language, you know, you're trying to, you, you are at a demo putting the best foot forward for the SCA. So you want to give it its best, best chance of success. Yeah, um, one of the things that Tristan mentioned, um, about um, you know the 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 entry fee uh, for getting getting started in the SCA, I think one of the things that I've always appreciated about our organization and, and something that I think we need to continue to encourage is, um, you know, when I first got started, there was the uh, pamphlet that came in, in with your membership card that said uh, that that what we expect is a reasonable attempt at pre seventeenth century garb, right? Um, we just want you to try. We want to, we want to have some, some sort of effort, you know, and T tunics and a pair of sweatpants. Um, that's fine. You know, and, you know, I, I, I've said for a long time that, that in a lot of ways, the SCA is kind of a victim of its own success where we have, you know, where it, it is, it is easier to, to be more period faster now than it was, you know, even 20 years ago. Um, it's, it's the, the resources that we have available, um, in, in, you know, just research and just like basic costuming stuff, like in the people that can get you started. Um, it is a lot easier to, to get into something, you know, that it, that is, you know, not just a reasonable attempt, but a more reasonable attempt. Um, but we, we are, we, we tend to have some of that where, as, as Eva mentioned, you know, you want to go to the demo and it's all the bling. You know, it's like, well, I can't be part of that organization because I can't do bling like that. Um, and, and when people see 
the the top shelf stuff that we do, it can absolutely be intimidating. And, you know, and the reality is in, in our, our sport has become much more a martial art than it has, you know, it, it continues to become more and more a martial art. And it takes, it takes a certain amount of effort um, to be competitive in what we do. Um, I do believe that the training methodologies that we're using now make that level like commensurate to the level of effort that you put into it. The, the amount of effort that it took to get knighted 20 years ago um, or 30 years ago, um, if you put in that amount of effort now, even though the fighting is better, the training is better. And if you put that effort out, you're, you're still going to be recognized within a reasonable, within a reasonable average. Um, so it, 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 but it can be intimidating and yeah, it's more, it is definitely more work to be, uh, to be exceptional in our sport now than it was 30 years ago. Um, you know, but the, the training is better too. So we need Felt to maintain like a lot of work 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I thought it was a lot of work too. Um, and it's, and it still is, but you know, you can, you can be good. At, yeah. Like it's, it's all a matter how much effort you put into it, but I think we just need to remember to maintain that thing where a reasonable effort, that's all we're asking. And, and, you know, to, to see somebody, you know, when you see somebody in that pickle barrel armor, um, at their first practice, you say, hey, that's a really great job on the armor there. Let me help you get a tunic to just cover that up, you know, cause you can cover up nasty looking armor. And then all of a sudden somebody is part of the, part of the game. So we're going to, we're going to move on to this with, um, we're going to pass this back to Eva to talk a little bit about a uh, little bit more about retention. Uh, so I should clarify as well that the the group that I'm in is kind of remote. Um, so for us, trying to to build and maintain the community is is a lot of what we end up thinking about. Uh, my partner Duke Felix Arnett is probably more the coach and the driver in our local group, um, but we work together to try and maintain a healthy community. And I think that that once you get the potential newbies in trying to build that sense of community, it's what is going to keep people around. Because again, the strength of the SCA is that we have that greater, wider community feel. Um, people, again, make it their entire lifestyle, but it's also important to recognize that not everybody is going to feel that way. And that's okay because numbers breed numbers, which is why I wanted to talk a little bit about thinking about assessing your, your new folks and not necessarily trying to force them into the, the mold that we think of as the idyllic SCA player, who is somebody who quite honestly is like, for me, I'm like, I want them to be as immersed as possible. I want them to, you know, not only fight, but to do all sorts of other things. That would be great if we all had it as our lifestyle, but not everybody's going to have that, but we still want those people out on the field with us because that's going to provide us with greater opportunities for training and greater opportunities for fighting and fun because again it should be fun and if they're not enjoying it there's something wrong um so for us part of building that sense of community is giving our newer players a sense of the broader sca so because for reference i live in adelaide south australia our closest other sca group is an eight hour drive to melbourne our biggest uh kingdom event is a 14 hour drive away um, so one of the things that will happen is that we end up with new people coming into our group and they only get to see things on a baronial level. They don't get a sense for the greater SCA. And I think that that's really where the greater hook is, is when you get to go to a war and you get to fight and meet new other people and see that what we do is actually huge. We're not a cult. It's not just 20 people in the park. We're literally an international organization. And the more people get uh, to see that and experience that, the more exciting it becomes. Another part of that as well is if you're also someone from a, a segregated or remote group, is that not every trainer is going to necessarily mesh with you. And so we always encourage our new people to travel as much as possible, meet other nights, get a sense for what the SEA really is before they get tied in with a particular household. Because maybe the, the you know, kung fu that we're selling doesn't mesh with them the way 
somebody else's will. And that's okay. And that diversity is actually really healthy because you want to be, you want to gain more from having multiple insights. So travel and experiencing the broader SCA as soon as possible is really awesome. That means that you might need to keep a couple of spare seats in your car as a, as a leader in your group, just so you can take new people to a war. You know, it'll, it'll be a case of make room so that you can help people get that experience. And then once they grow up a little bit, they'll be able to do that for other people, hopefully. Um, and finding them a home as well. So encourage them to go and meet other people. Encourage them to seek out the, the people in the SCA that they mesh with because it's only going to breed a more diverse and more enriched culture in your local group. Um, I had other stuff. Um, and, and sometimes, I'm bringing this back to before where I talked about the umbrella, some people will play slightly differently to you. That's okay. You know, I tend to look at uh, what Felix and I have built. We do 14th, 15th and 16th century stuff. We're kind of broad. I'm not a, uh, uh, a person who really does a persona as such. Some people will. There are households that will suit people who want to do Dark Ages stuff better or who want to do uh, ancient Greek and Roman. That's cool. Find those people. Encourage that community building and encourage people to do what makes them happy. Because again, diversity is going to give you a bigger, more enriched group and improve your training. And uh, the last thing that I wanted to touch on is that you want to treat each new person as an individual. So that will come down to, you know, using and trying different kinds of language and training techniques for each individual person, because that's going, that's one of the huge things is that you hear about someone spoke to a trainer and what they were training with didn't work for them, but they got stuck into it because they went, well, it must be me. I'm not getting it, which sometimes is 50, 50. Sometimes you do need to work harder to attain a specific goal or learn a specific concept. But also if you're not having a diverse way of it being explained, sometimes it's just not going to mesh with you and that's okay. And another aspect of that is that some people are not going to be lifestyle players and that's okay. So communicating and going, what are your goals? And if they say to you, well, I just want to be a weekend warrior. Like I only want to turn up and smash people once a week or once a month. You go, cool. Those people are actually amazing for me because it means that I don't have to exert excess emotional energy trying to teach them things they don't care about. It means that I can literally go up to them in a training and go, you want to fight? Yes. Cool. And I can just train myself in that time. I don't have to worry. That communication is important. And those people are important because they, again, build the numbers at your training that are only going to breed more numbers. So that's okay. So remember, some people are going to want to be the greatest super duke that's ever been. And some people just want to turn up once a month and all of those people have a place here. That, that very well described, you know, that, that point of, of connecting with that person that comes in. Um, when I, uh, when I have a new student that comes into my dojo, one of my first questions is obviously, do you have some other martial art background? But the big one that I want to know is what is your interest? What is it that you really want? so that I can get that to you. Because people come in with different interests. Some say, I want to learn some self-defense. Others say, I want to really get into, you know, Aikido, the art. I, I like the spiritual side. I like the philosophical. There's all different kinds of things. And, and the SCA has that exact same thing. In fact, it even has more because there's so much more breadth to it. When you say, what is it you really want to do? And you, you show that you're you earnestly want to hear the answer to their question. And when they give you that answer, you say, let me connect you with that. Let me get you what you're looking for. You're showing that you have caring and trust. And that's something that it can, that could be easily lost when we think, well, I've, I've showed up to practice. I'm here to put on my helmet. I'm working on my, my own technique. And I now I have this new person in front of me that either came in or, or, or got brought to the demo, and I'm thinking, well, is this person going to be serious? Are they going to, you look at it in the wrong way. As long as you focus your intention on saying, this is a great thing that I've found. Let me tell you how awesome this is, or how, how much I enjoy it. If this is something that you're interested in, what part interests you, and let me get you connected with that. If I can't provide it to you, I'm going to find the person that can, and I'm going to, I'm going to put you right there 
to talk to that person that's going to get you what you want out of this. The, the part of that relationship that's important is the caring, that when somebody new shows up, the first person they talk to is earnestly interested in what they have to say and wants to get them what it is that they want in, the, in as short amount of time as possible. Um, and, and unfortunately, I've seen a fair bit of disregard shown to new people that come in. A lot like the the Civil War reenactors, like, what does this person got to offer us? You know, what are, what are they going to add to the group? But another new person, I gotta I gotta bend over backwards for and walk through, you know, go through nursery school with them. Like that's the wrong attitude. And I think that this is something that we can clean up. Generally, not everybody does this, but there's enough. Having seen the rotating door of people come in new, they either have nobody that comes to ask them, hey, what you know. Does this look interesting to you? If so, let me show you around or let me answer your questions. Let me connect you with what, you're, what you have interest in. We sometimes get a little too absorbed into what we're doing that we overlook that crucial, important part of recruiting. And then there comes the retention part, which is can we keep them on that path towards their interest? Can we make sure and attend them so that they don't get dropped off or left left to to uh, wander around wondering well, who's going to help me what you know I, I'd like to do more but I don't know who to talk to and then they they kind of lose interest and I think I think Sagan talked about the people that they're around long enough and then they see bad things they're like oh this doesn't look right and nobody sorts it out or describes to them okay here's what's going on and I love the the broken stare uh, analogy or say, you know, some, somebody new comes in and says, I've got some serious concerns, what's going on here. And then they're told, well, it's just like that, just ignore it. And so I think there's multiple layers of how we can deal with the retention issue, but it starts at the lowest level and then goes up to how do we deal with the, I, I, I'll call them atrocities because they certainly get into that category. And I'm, I feel strongly about that one as well. And I, and I, think that the transparency when it comes to justice is very important. And I would criticize the SCA in general for trying to going go, try to go overboard with censoring what caused uh, somebody to get punished on the few times that they actually do, but how often, you know, bad behavior just tends to be left to the broken stare thing of, well, it's just like that, he, you know, guy's a jerk or what, what have you. Uh, I think we could clean up that as well. And I prefer honesty, but that's just my personality. I like honesty. I like transparency. I, from a personal standpoint, I like it just saying I made a mistake. I'm willing to own it. Let's just use personal responsibility as our, as the solution to this, not trying to, you know, cover anything up or, uh, or try to make it seem like what is a problem is not because I assure you people will see it. And if you view new people coming in at, at as children, don't ever underestimate their ability to observe and see what's going wrong. Don't think they don't know it. You're actually insulting that person's intelligence by saying, oh, I'm experienced. I can see this is bad, but you won't. Like, that's absolutely the wrong way to go about it. Um, you know, assume that they're observant people. And I, unfortunately, I've known way too many people that have come in interested, passionate. They like what, what the SCA is doing. And they run across some of those bad actors and they say, you know what, I'm just, I'm not down with this and I'm, I'm leaving. And, and that's part of what makes this the elephant to the room is, all right, we need to change something. We need to change how we deal with this. And it doesn't mean that you need to be a kingdom officer or a crown or any, any, you know, on the board of directors in order to say, we've got to call this and we've got to do something about it. Um, and I think that that is a retention issue. Somebody want to jump in? Let's say you. Yep. Go. One of the things to remember is that in trying to be an example of the good side, you are accomplishing something in retention. You are the example. Maybe you're the exception. However. As long as there are more examples of the of the good side, not the dark side, then you know retention is hopeful. Mm -hmm. 
as a part of that, though, you know, you do have to always, at least from my point of view, in my humble opinion, you, you know, you're open, you're honest, you're understanding. You encourage questions and conversations about anything. Now then, some of the questions you're going to get, you do need to be careful about the answers. Because you are about to or could be about to affect the experience of someone, whether they're a longstanding member, a brand new person, or somebody who's been in like six months. So you need to be compassionate in a way. However, I did say you need to be honest and you need to be open. You know, you, you, as far as trainers go, you are given the opportunity of practices, whether they're private, whether they're public, uh, of encouraging conversations and questions, maybe even holding an open forum to answer questions and address issues. The other thing you can do is you can offer assistance with whatever. And you can, you know, if you would like, give your contact information to those who would like to speak with you in private. One of the major things as a coach and a trainer, if it turns out that for X number of individuals, fighting just isn't what they're interested in, then I would recommend wholeheartedly assisting them to find something else within the SCA that might hold their interest. And in the end, you are that example of not just being a good coach and a good trainer, but you're also being the example of a good SCA member, Knight, Royal Peer, however far you want to take it. All right, Eva? I wanted to hop back in because Tristan uh, touched on something that I, I completely forgot about, but I cannot emphasize how important it is. And it's, uh, so Felix had actually taught all of our squires who were starting to go through the basics with new guys. It, the question is, what is the most important first lesson you can teach anybody on their first day? Even if you don't hit your basic shots, the most important lesson is that somebody cares about them that somebody actually gives a shit that they're there and we're there to help them. So, you know, amongst all the other, you know, issues that we're talking about, even if they only learn that somebody cares that they attended and is trying to help them get into our sport, that's really the most important thing you can do for anyone on their first day. Um, and then if they experience other issues, part of that as well is that they know that you're there for support. So, you know, if somebody turns up, make sure that they know that you're interested in them getting involved in our sport. Everything else on top of that will, will come naturally as they form a bond with you and form that community. Well said. Eli, I'm trying to find the mute button. Mute, there we go. Um, so to, to follow up on that, um, both content and context carry a lesson. It's not just what you're saying, it's how you're saying it. It's how you're presenting it. So there's a, a principle in the classroom of modeling the behavior you want to see in students. And I, I know that in uh, like uh, a lot of people's experience of being coached in a sport, comes from high school and high school coaches by and large come out of a tradition of bullying their players, shouting at them, um, insulting them uh, to, and, and I never found that motivating. I found it insulting. Uh, it's like, explain this to me. Don't just yell at me, explain to me what you want, explain why I'm not doing it. You know, it, it's, and I think that, I think uh, he was correct in that it's not, the lesson is in how you present it is that you're caring enough to present it, to help somebody with it. And I think that's really important. It's not just what you say, it's how you're presenting it. And that relates to another, another point in that 
I've, we're, we've talked about courtesy and the importance of that, but I've met people who think that if you're being courteous, you're being dishonest, you're hiding something, and they are being honest because they're being blunt or brutally honest. The problem with being brutally honest is there's more emphasis on the brutal than the honest. And it's the, as I, when people have asked me about peerage, I said a, a peer has the um, courage to be honest and the, the strength to be courteous all at the same time. And if it were easy, it, anybody could do it. Well, I think anybody can do it. And it's not easy, it just takes some, some help and some guidance and some training. And this relates to, co when we're coaching people in the, our martial sport, we're not just coaching their performance in the sport, we're coaching them as people. And if we lose sight of that and just focus on the mechanics of what they're doing, we're losing, we're giving them the content, but we're not giving them the context and we're losing something. Yeah, and I, I think to that point too, um, if we, if we and, and, and honestly, this is something, one of the many lessons that I got from Sagan over the years is, you know, there's, as a trainer, <clears throat> you know, great power, with great power comes great responsibility. And if I'm going to give you a certain set of tools for you to, to uh, effectively end up in one of the most powerful positions in our sport, um, that comes with a certain responsibility. And if we don't give you the tools to, to, you know, be able to deal with people, um, you know, magnanimously, um, you know, then, then we have failed the organization for sure, because then you end up with just all the power and none of the responsibility. And that typically ends up in, you know, some of these issues that we're, that we're talking about where people just kind of get on that power trip once they sit on the thrones and they think that that's, that that's the end all be all and, and that they are, you know, all powerful and all knowing and um, having, you know, all of us having sat the thrones in some capacity or another, we know uh, power in this organization is fleeting at best and uh, is grossly overrated. Um, but there, there are some people that, that get it in their head that, that, that's going to be that's going to be their power trip and, and like we have an obligation to kind of kind of curtail that a, a little bit so um so we're, we're uh about to wrap up here so just kind of wanted to pass over to uh, uh tristan any, any final thoughts for you on that um yeah i think we've covered some good ground here you know obviously with the with the the virus and the lockdowns and stuff this is something that's probably not very pressing i don't think anybody's doing demos right now a lot of practices are shut down. I, I think that this is a time when we can look at our plan for what happens when things start getting back to normal. How can we change, use this break to take a breath and relook at how we look at recruiting, how we look at retention, examine what we're doing. There's always a time to, to revisit how we've done things and say, what have we done well? What have we done not so well? And what could we improve on to bring those things that we're not doing well up to a good quality level? We can always be improving. And I think the SCA, like you said earlier, was a victim of its own success. When you grow to a certain point, you can't, it's easy to take for granted, well, we've got a lot of people we're doing really well. We don't need to worry about recruiting so much. We don't need to re re worry about retention so much. It's, it's an ongoing process because the world changes. The things that affect people change. When computer games came in, you know, that was a change. And, and to not, uh, this is a big thing for me personally, is how you let your mind affect uh, how you act. If you think that an excuse like gas prices were too high or computer games are taking away people, your mind will just go, I don't need to do anything better. It's something else. It's not my problem. But that will always hamper you. That will always get in your way. Your own mind will be your, the, the greatest prison that you will have to escape at some point. And so if, but if we look at it as the, no computer game can do what the SCA can do. P flat out. 
like no no computer game offers that kind of immersion that kind of social bonding the caring part and just the caring and i, I loved how much we talked about that of when somebody new shows up if they get the i care that you're here i'm glad that you're here let me help you no computer game will do that none we need to acknowledge that acknowledge how we are different and really work that strength with with people but it has to come from ourselves from the caring that we like to have other people come into our group and to put aside you know the the all right well what am i here to do for myself it's what you're here to do for yourself plus what you can bring other people into your sport with and i i assure you my dojo is the exact same way every one of my students cares about how other students are learning as much as they care about how they are learning and without that culture I would be churning people through and they'd come in and quit in sh very short order because I've seen that happen with dojos and the SCA is the exact same way. So that's what I would have as a conclusion is it's all built on, on that heart of, you know, caring for other people as much as you care or more than you care for your own advancement. Eli. There we go. There we okay. Go. So, um, I think that the, the SCA by and large has made a lot of progress in the use of social media. Websites have improved, social media use has improved. And given that a lot of people interact on social media a lot, particularly some of the people that we would like to bring in as younger people into the society, I think we need to continue to improve our use of that. Um, the consistency of messaging um, in all its different iterations is important, whether it's social media or printed material or personal interactions, because particularly personal interactions, which you've talked about, because all the best information, all the best communication, all the best messaging can be stymied by a new person's interaction with a single person whose messaging is off or whose behavior is off or who doesn't demonstrate that community and that caring and that, that personal interaction. So I think that in the same way that we are uh, doing the coach's corner where we're talking to people about how to improve, but we also talk to people about how to be better coaches it would be worthwhile if we did a coach, coach of interaction, if we're, which is kind of what we're doing here. How do you interact with people? How do you help people? How do you recruit people? How do you retain people? Training the, uh, train the trainer for how to do that. Uh, and people who interact, not just with new people, but everybody in the society and coming back to the idea of chivalry and courtesy throughout the society and throughout all our interactions. All right, Sagan. One of the things we all share is that at one point, we were all coming to the SCA for the first time. So we've all been there. So we have somewhat of an understanding of what that experience was like for us, however long ago that was. We also now, as Knights, we have asked others to enter into partnerships with us. And we guard those partnerships. We are open, we're honest, we're respectful, we're dutiful in those relationships, as well as asking newcomers and or people who are not sure they want to hang around any longer to partner with us as well in whatever capacity that is. Maybe it's just somebody they, they know that you're open and honest to a discussion or, or a question and that you are there for them. And as Ava said, that's one of the most important things we can be, is we can be there for others as they were there for us in the beginning. And with that, I, I would close with the idea that again. Oh, you muted yourself. We are the ones who have an opportunity to be the best example we can. 
All right, Eva? Yep, I'm gonna keep it short and sweet. I can imagine that if people are watching this, it's because that they either are or aspire to be leaders in their group as coaches. So I always say that you should lead with conscience, empathy, and humility. Put yourself in the newbie's shoes or in your student's shoes. Always try to treat others as you would want to be treated. And that comes down to every interaction that you're having, not just at training. And understand that we can always be better. We, as humans, we are imperfect entities. So just think to yourself, how can you improve the experience for them? How can you improve the way you're presenting or what you're doing? And how can you make people feel more comfortable and included? And if you try every time, you might not succeed, but at least you're attempting to be better every day. And that is a noble cause. Great. All right, so to, uh, to wrap up here, um, I, I think it's important to note that um, you know, when we do these things, the, the elephant in the room in particular, it's, uh, we're, trying to, we're, we're, we're trying to address some of, the, some of the issues that come up that, that we often don't talk about and that maybe we should. But it's important to realize that uh, we certainly aren't going to give you any, any answers uh, necessarily or any concrete you know, step-by-step -step things you can do to, to fix all of our worldly problems. Um, but we do want to have that conversation. Um, we are open to that conversation in general. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to, to, to hit us up on the, the coach's corner. Um, and I think some of the topics that we talked about tonight are going to be addressed in, in more in depth in, uh, in the policing, you know, policing our own, because um, that's something that we have all talked about as coaches um, uh, pretty passionately um, as, as something that, that we need to address. Um, and, but, but like I said, we're, we're, we're not going to be able to fix anything tonight in, in one episode, but we definitely appreciate everybody tuning in and uh, being part of that conversation. Um, as always, we'd like to uh, offer our thanks to Vesper for uh, keeping us on track and uh, handling Thank the production you, side of things for us. Always appreciate you. Yeah, yeah. Always. It's always and, an uh, honor to be a part of this with you. So thank you for spending the time and every and Friday night. It's always a highlight. Yeah, it is for me, even when I'm not on the show. Like, you know, of course, if I'm not on the show, then I'm like frantically commenting on the on the live feed going, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> He's <laughs> trolling us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was trolling him. I'm like, see, just like I said. Um, so next week on the coach's corner, we have, uh, ideas for, uh, indoor ideas for practice, um, as we're getting into winter time and a lot of, a lot of folks, uh, except, uh, Eva's getting into springtime, I suppose, or into summer, you're coming into summer there. So <laughs> doesn't apply to yeah, her as much. <laughs> <laughs> we will, um, yeah, we'll so be talking I, about some things I, that you I can do. We all move there. So we can enjoy summer and, and practice outside. Sounds like a good idea to me. Uh, so we'll be dealing with that. Um, but uh, always want to thank the thank our other coaches, Eli, Tristan, Sagan, and especially uh, your grace, Sir Eva. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it was delightful to have you. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's great to hear your, your thoughts on this and something you obviously thought a lot about, which is why I wanted to have you on. So thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's nice meeting you, Eva. Good meeting you. That looks All right. wraps us up. Well, yeah, we'll close it out. And um, thanks again for joining us. So everybody have a good night. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Bye.